Hello and welcome to our Gower Society Youth Virtual uh, Mini Beast Hunt. Now welcome live, we're live here on Facebook and we're here in Reynoldston in my garden. Unfortunately our Gower Society Youth event can't happen as it normally does but we're still continuing with our activities thanks to the funding of the Gower Society and please if you do want to watch any of these videos they're all going to be still on Facebook for a long time and also on the Nature Days YouTube channel. Now if you were here for my spring stroll last month then you'll see gardens change quite a bit but today we're focusing in on mini beasts. Now last month we were looking at plants and plants are very easy because when you go there you can film them, you can go away, you come back and they're still there. Whereas mini beasts don't tend to do that. So you're going to have to think of today as a bit like a safari park. You may get up close and personal to some of them but some of the mini beasts may not be actually appearing today and also because of the technology we've got you may not get be able to get in as close to see the animals that you might want to but I have uploaded on my YouTube channel hashtag nature days a virtual mini beast hunt of the animals I have seen in my garden before and those have got some real good close-ups of lots of the animals so hopefully if you want to get some more detail you can look at those and please subscribe to my nature days um, YouTube channel and then if I do any more you can actually see them and you can get subscribing there so we're going to start with one of the best plants that we saw in our spring stroll. This one here, if you recognise it, this is the willow. Changed quite a bit, all the catkins have fallen off, it's finished with the willow, uh, with its um, uh, flower season. But we're more interested in the foliage now, because that's what the mini beasts are eating. Now if you are looking for mini beasts, one of the best ways to look is actually not for the mini beast itself, but is some kind of feeding sign, something that shows that a mini beast is eating. And a lot of these mini beasts are herbivores. So if we look at this willow here, we can see on these two leaves that something has been eating here. And this mini beast here, if you have a look, I don't know if you can see, but there is actually an awful lot actually eating away this poor little willow leaf. I don't know why we, this leaf has actually been chosen by all of them, but this willow leaf is being absolutely devoured by these. Now, it's very hard to see because they're very, very small, but these look a bit like caterpillars, but in fact, they're not caterpillars. And the only way you could tell if you looked really closely at their legs. Now I'm gonna show you a model of a caterpillar to give you an idea. So if you have a look at this model, we can, I can understand, uh, tell you what I mean. So this is a caterpillar model and all caterpillars and all insects when they've got a larval stage look very different from their adult. So of course those are going to turn into an adult which is actually winged but not a butterfly. So those little grubs there that look like this have got the six legs at the front of their body just like a caterpillar has. And then of course you've got lots of segments down the back like a caterpillar has. Now all caterpillars have got these which are called prolegs. Now the number of prolegs depends on the species. Lots of them have got four pairs there you can see along the back and these aren't really legs they can bend or do anything with apart from just sucker onto the leaf. So they've got little suckers at the end and these prolegs hold on to the vegetation and it means that if their legs are all on the front of their body, the back of their body, their abdomen and their thorax along here, all those segments are not being dragged along the ground or the vegetation. They've also got the back, this is uh, anal claspers here, so these are also holding on to the vegetation. So sometimes you can see them holding on to a leaf and waving those six legs, real legs, true legs, in the air. So they couldn't do that if they didn't have these prolegs. But they will always have a gap in their thoracic section which doesn't have any prolegs. These mini beasts here, if I show you these back on here, again, likely is you won't be able to see them. If you look closely at these and look at all of their segments, every single segment has a true leg or a proleg. So they're all the back ones, so straight after the third segment, which is the end of the true legs, you've got pro legs all the way to the end when you've got your anal claspers. So these are not caterpillars. These are sawfly larvae. Now you've probably never seen a sawfly. Many people haven't, I haven't, but you rarely see the adult. But the larvae are very similar to the caterpillars. If I show you a picture of what a sawfly looks like, they're really tiny. They only grow probably about a centimetre if you're lucky, but really small. Now their life cycle, what they do, because they're a sawfly, 
That doesn't mean they can hurt you. What they do is their ovipositor, so the back of where they lay their eggs there, so they've got a tiny little ovipositor, most of the um, invertebrates have, most of the insects have, that is how they lay their eggs. So they fly over to a leaf, they use that ovipositor, which is like a saw, to saw a hole into the leaf, and then they lay their eggs inside the leaf. Now, the amazing thing about this is, if you come over here, you can see we've got one. Where are you? Uh, let me find one. This one here, it's only a tiny one. Ah, here we go. So this leaf is suddenly being cut open by the ovipositor of a sawfly, and this is a willow saw, gall sawfly, and this leaf reacts to the fact that it's just been sawed open and had a load of eggs shoved inside it, or one egg. So it squirts out material over it, creating a gall. So this is a gall. So it's a reaction to being infested by this larvae. But the larvae is quite happy because that's exactly what it wants. Because the egg inside this gall here will then hatch out, will eat the inside of the gall. And when it's big enough, it will then cut open with its mouth parts and then it will drop down to the floor. Now I can show you a picture of what the larvae look like up close. Now we haven't got the... There we go. So looks a bit like a tiny little maggot. Maggots are baby flies, so I suppose it is a maggot. So again, but if you looked underneath, you would have these legs all the way along. So this is living inside that tiny little gall. So when it's old enough, it will fall down onto the floor. And if I just show you, if we cut open one of those galls, there we have it. You'd have it living inside there. Teeny tiny they are, literally about two, three millimetres long. Once it's fallen down, it will then pupate, so it will wrap itself up in silk, and then it will turn into, a, it will metamorphose, it will do a complete metamorphosis into our sawfly. And then that sawfly will fly back to probably the same plant, why not, or it could be another one, and then it will do the same, lay some eggs inside the leaf, and the leaf will create the gall. And that's the like cycle of the sawfly. And so in between coming out of that gall, going onto the floor, this is what this plant, this sawfly larvae here, has been having a really good feast on this willow. So that is the sawfly larvae. Right, the other thing we've got here, if you come over here, you can see evidence that there's another mini beast also using the willow. Now, where is it? It's always best when you're looking for mini beasts to look underneath the leaves, because if animals such as mini beasts are living on the top of the leaves, they're very run vulnerable to being eaten by predators. Here we go. So if we look at this leaf here, now it may not look like much, but can you see it's folded? There's another one there that's folded. So this could be another sawfly or a gall, but actually it's probably a caterpillar this time because it hasn't actually created the gall by the leaf doing an um, excretion. It's actually rolled itself up in the leaf. So a caterpillar has been up here, been munching away, eaten up in enough in its larval stage for it to be ready to pupate. And then it's rolled itself up in the leaf. And if you look at the top, is it closed? If it's closed, that means there's still the caterpillar in there and it's turned into the pupa, so it's pupating. It's covering itself in something, so it's got the leaf, but it might cover itself in some um, silk. And then it will be really busy in there, metamorphosing into probably a moth. This is probably a moth caterpillar in here because of the size. And when it's ready, it's chew its way through the end of that uh, chrysalis and then fly off. And then again, it might come back here to lay its eggs. So we've got our sawfly larvae living on here. We've got caterpillars using it as a chrysalis. And what I am looking for, because I found them before, fingers crossed I'll find them again, is some eggs. Here they are, here they are. So look at the size of those, teeny tiny. So these are caterpillar eggs. So it could be caterpillar, it could be a moth caterpillar, it could be a uh, butterfly caterpillar. And realistically, I shouldn't really call them caterpillar eggs because caterpillars can't lay eggs. These are butterfly or moth eggs. So these have been laid here and they may here stay here for a few weeks or a few months. And then they will turn into the tiny little caterpillars, start to eat around this leaf here. Then they will probably fold it up, cupate, and then they'll come out as moths. Then they will go and mate, come back and lay some eggs back on this plant. 
So this willow is such an amazing plant for so many mini beasts. That's just two leaves we've seen and we've seen the home for the eggs, we've seen the home for the larval stage, we've seen the larval stage eating and we've seen it starting to pupate and then of course the butterfly will, or the moth will fly away or the, the fly will go away. The only thing that willow doesn't provide is food for the adult, which is the flower. And if you watched our spring stroll last month, you'll know that the flowers of the willow are wind pollinated, so they don't have nectar, they don't have pretty colours or flowers that, that are useful to pollinators, so this won't provide any food for the adult stage of any of those. Now, we're gonna try and find out if there's anything else living in this tree that I've missed by just looking. Because if you think about it, everything in this in this, this um, tree here is a food source for something else. So in your food web, we've got the leaves here providing the food for our grubs, our um, larvae. But then we've got our birds, like the sparrows that we've got nesting in the house, who are gonna come in and eat those um, caterpillars and those grubs and those larvae and take them for their young. And it's not a coincidence that this is all happening at the same time. Last month, that wouldn't be possible here because there weren't any leaves. This month, we've got all the leaves, so this is when all the baby um, larvae are starting to come out because they've got a good food source. It's also the same time as the birds are nesting because they've also got the food source because they're going to eat the larvae. So they're all happening at the same time. It's amazing the way that the interconnectedness between the animals, the plants and the whole environment around us. So it's really important that we maintain this variety of plants so that we get a variety of animals. But in order to find out what else is living here, because they're really well camouflaged to hide from those predators, I'm going to try and use a technique called tree beating. Now I've got a special tree beating device here, but if you've got any plants at home which are quite large, they could be trees or they could be bushes, you can do this and all you need is a bed sheet and somebody to help you. So all you have to do is hold the bed sheet underneath your branch, make sure it's a branch you can reach, and you need to kind of creep up on these animals. So you need to hold it still, as still as you can, and then you're gonna give it a shake, okay? So it's quite a hard shake. All right, let's have a look at the hazel under here, see if we can get some more from there. one. Now as I said this is live so I have no idea if we will see anything at all but if, word of warning if you're doing this at home the species of the tree is really important. As I said willow great for mini beasts but the best tree is actually the oak. Oak trees can be home to more than 500 different species and if you shake an oak um, tree you will get a lot of them. Sycamore if you're lucky you'll get aphids so don't even bother with them. But as we know, willow's good, hazel's good, we know it's good, something's eating it. So fingers crossed we can find something. So all you need to do is look at your sheet and see if anything is moving. There we go. So we've got a fly there. I must admit I'm not brilliant on flies, but that could be one of our sawflies. That would make sense if we got it from our willow, which has got our sawfly galls. So we've got flies there. Again, he's probably been in a bit of shock. Okay. We've got a twig. <laughs> now, the other thing is, is that everything is deliberately camouflaged so that you don't know what it is. That one there. Oh, that looks like a springtail. I did my dissertation on those. I can tell you all about them, but they're amazing, actually. What you do with a springtail, I don't know if I can, we can get this on camera because they're microscopic, usually live in the, in the soil, actually, is they've a spring in their tail that's why they called it and what they do is they curl it up like a little spring and then when they get attacked they will jump yeah you're never gonna work no doesn't do it but yeah also over here we've got our first arachnid so this is a red spider mite so red spider mite there count its legs it's got eight legs so it's not an insect it's in the arachnid family so these spider mites here will be living on other animals in this tree and living off them, sucking their blood. Also over here, again, you'll find this in all trees, we've got an aphid. Aphids are animals. And just remember that one, because when we find some other animals later, 
this is actually the cow of the ant world. Because when we see the cow, the ants, we'll be able to see what I mean. And then lastly, we've got a lovely caterpillar. Now I'm going to try and turn him round, see if you can see those legs. So at the front, we've got our six, a pokey stick. So we've got our six, there he goes. Now this is a looper. Oh, exactly. This is what I wanted to show you actually. I didn't put him there, I promise. So we've got six legs at the front. These are the real true legs. But this species, this group has actually only got two pro legs at the back, at the very back there. So there's two pro legs there and then the anal claspers. See how it can hold on with its rear legs, its rear pro legs and its anal claspers. And then all of its legs are now in the air. This is how it looks further away and also moves from leaf to leaf. But because the central part has no pro legs and no true legs, it would be rubbing along the ground if it didn't loop them up like this. So loopers, if you ever see a caterpillar with looping along like this, it means it's a looper caterpillar because it's only got those pro legs on the back. And of course, this isn't a sawfly larvae because in the middle, if you look, there are no legs whatsoever. So we've got our looper caterpillar here. Now caterpillars, of course, this is like the second stage in their life cycle. Their eggs, as we saw on the willow, have now sprouted, um, have now hatched, and this has been eating for quite a bit. And I'd say this one's probably due to pupate to turn into a butterfly. Now, what butterfly it's going to turn into? Not sure. I'd have to look very closely. You'd have to look at its face, look at its colourings, look at its stripes. The fact that it is a looper, it does restrict it. And loopers tend to be moths, so it will probably again turn into a moth. Best thing you can do if you do find caterpillars and you want to learn more about them is to keep them in a jar with some holes, obviously, and lots of nice vegetation like the willow. They love the willow or stinging nettles. They love stinging nettles and just watch him. And then if he's this size, quite soon he will actually pupate and then he'll spin silk around himself and then he'll start to do nothing. But he's actually very, very busy because inside that pupa, that chrysalis, he'll be completely metamorphosing. And that's called complete metamorphosis. And that's what happens when you have young, which are called larvae, that look nothing like their adult. I've got a butterfly in the bag, which I'll show you now. And of course, this looks nothing like a butterfly. So we call this a larvae. The opposite is an animal that's not exactly the same as its um, adult and young but is a bit different and they have incomplete metamorphosis and we'll try and show you one that has incomplete and then you can see the difference. So I'm going to put this lovely larvae caterpillar back where I found it. Very important when you've finished with your animals, very carefully put them back. If you imagine this poor caterpillar, if I put him on the floor here, he's going to have to get himself all the way to the bottom of the tree, climb all the way up here. And all what he did was sit on this leaf at the wrong time when I was actually shaking it. So please make sure you put your animals back where you found them. And he should be happy there because he can hold on. There he goes, he's holding on. He's got a nice food source. And there we go. And I think that's all we've got from our tree beating. Anything else? Lots of tiny things. Oh, again, tiny little money spider there. And again, we've got another little aphid, green aphid. And you might say, I see up there, I go, a little green fly up there as well. But I think that's it. Okay, I'll let them fly back. So if I can show you a butterfly now. Lots of butterflies don't live for very long. Only an adult for about a month. And if that's the case, you can find them quite easily dead. And there's, you know, if they're dead, then there's no reason why you can't collect them. But please, please, please do not ever collect live animals and hurt them or kill them. So this one here, this is a small tortoise shell. Now, can I open it without breaking? Now, if you do ever go for a butterfly hunt, it's very easy to hurt butterflies because they're so delicate their wings are actually made up of tiny little scales. They're in the group called Lepidoptera, and that means scaled insect. So these scales are covered in a thin layer of powder, like dust. And if you ever touch the, the actual um, wing, 
the dust will come off in your hand and you will actually shift those scales and you'll end up removing all the scales from the, the wing and the wings become like a skeleton and of course they can't fly then. So please do not ever handle a butterfly, especially when it's alive and it's flying around. If you do want to try and hold one or catch one, best thing to do, and it goes for all insects and all mini beasts, get it to crawl into your hand or into a pot. Don't try and pick it up because you're very likely to hurt it. You're very strong. They're very weak and small. So please be very careful. So if we look at the body shape here, well, it's a bit old this one. This body shape here, this is literally the caterpillar. But if you can see, can you see that white thing? I don't know if you can see that white thing there. No? Okay, there's a white little tube there. And that tube, if you look at me, the tube actually goes round in a circle like this. And that's called the proboscis. And the proboscis of a butterfly and of lots of other um, pollinators are perfectly adapted to getting into where the nectar is on those flowers. If I can show you a flower here, it's amazing how these work together and how they've co-evolved. So this flower here, this is a honeysuckle flower. If you look at the shape of it, it's very long and thin. Now, very beautiful, but flowers don't think, I want to be beautiful. They're evolving for a function, for a reason. And if you look at the front, we did this last in the, in the spring stroll, you can see the anthers there, that's with the pollen on the male part, and the st stigma that's there at the end of the style, the sticky bit, the female part. Now this flower wants the pollen to go from this flower to another flower, not to its same flower. And it does that by attracting a mini beast, a pollinator. Now this pollinator is not coming to here to pollinate. That's not what it wants. It wants to have a, f it's a food source. And the food source for these pollinators is nectar. And the nectar is in the flower, but the flower knows that the pollinator wants to get the nectar. It doesn't want to get the pollen. So it makes the pollinator, it makes the pollinator go in as far as you can before it actually lets it leave. So the reason we have such a long proboscis is that it can go inside here, right the way to the very end. And if I pull off the tip here, this is where your um, nectar actually is. So the nectar, if I suck it, mm, oh, nice, sweet, is at the very end of the tube. Mm, yummy. Now, I haven't got a proboscis, so I have to break the flower. And that doesn't help the flower because I haven't gone past the anther. But if this was a pollinator, it would force its way through there, past the pollen, and get rubbed the pollen on its body somehow. Its proboscis would go all the way down the tube, get to the nectar, fly off. See, look, some of the pollen has gone onto the antennae of this, um, this butterfly. Flies off to another one. It then goes past the sticky stigma, passes the pollen onto the stigma as it goes to get another drink. And therefore it's done its job as pollinating. So the way that these flowers have evolved is to make the job of pollinating a byproduct of these pollinators eating. So again, this is a flag iris, again, perfectly adapted to allow the mini beast to land on this nice platform here, nice little runway, but all the nectar is right the way down here. So it has to push past here. And what do we have in here? Have a look. We have our anther full of pollen. So it has to push past there, gets covered in pollen, gets to the point where it can't go any further. Long proboscis goes down, drinks up its nectar, comes back, and then when it flies to another one, it will try and get some more and it will rub that pollen onto that one. Okay. Right, I may have to take the camera in a minute because we're going low on battery and I may have to take it while Stu goes to get some. <laughs> so I'm gonna grab the camera and hopefully you can see me because I have no idea what I'm looking at. And we are going to go and have a look in a different habitat. We're going to look underneath some stones. Now, hopefully you've all got stones in your garden. So I'm going to look underneath this stone and see what we can see. Oh. There we go. Right, let's have a look under here. Oh. And there we have. Right, so we have our wood lice. 
Now, there's over 20 different species of wood lice in this country and they are incredible creatures because they're very maternal. They are one of the few um, mini beasts that actually look after their young. So if you look, you'll see lots of them together and they're actually a family group. So the old, the actual mother there, the mother there actually has a brood pouch and that brood pouch is a bit like a joey on a, in a kangaroo and they look after their young in there for a few months and then when they've actually come to the brood pouch they're actually one family group. The wood lice is what they eat. Now they're called wood lice so you can imagine they eat wood, they do, they eat rotting wood. They also eat dead leaves, they eat dead animals, they also eat poo. But the most important poo that they eat is their own poo. Because these animals have got weird blood. Our blood is made out of a nice, really important metal called iron. But in fact, their blood is actually made out of copper. So their blood, if you looked inside it, their blood would actually be see-through. If it was exposed to the air, then it would actually be blue. So they have blue blood. A bit like some other creatures, many spiders and tarantulas have got blue blood. Also some mollusks, sea mollusks, such as octopuses. They have blue blood as well and some squids as well. Now the reason they need to eat their poo is because that copper is quite hard to get hold of in their vegetation, in their diet. So if they poo it out every time they have a poo, they're going to run out. So what they do is they eat their poo to actually get the copper back inside them. So they're recycling. And they are actually the world's best recyclers because they get rid of all the dead organic matter. And when they poo out, they will also create soil. So they are really fantastic. Now, if I can get hold of one, now these have got an exoskeleton, so they're very strong. So they're quite easy to hold without hurting them. Oh, no, I've dropped it. Okay, so if I show you one up close, we can have a look. We can look at some identifying features. So nice big antennae at the front and wood lice have got um, usually about 12 segments along their body, maybe 14, and they usually have seven pairs of legs down their body as well, so they have 14 legs in total. They are arthropods, so they bend their legs, so their legs bend and they have got this very hard exoskeleton down the back which means that they have to molt so you can find them molt quite often and surprising for some people this is actually related not to the many other uh, mini beasts you find in your garden but they're actually related to crabs and lobsters they're a crustacean and that's why they've got such a hard outer skeleton much harder than the other mini beasts you'll find inside the garden so quite a different group this is found in and they are adapted to live in the garden but in fact they need to be in a very precise environmental conditions if these were out in the air like this one is for too long they will dry out and die so you will always find them in the dark areas which are found which are usually moist so they stay wet and cold so if you do again find these mini beasts and you want to do a nice experiment with them you can make up a nice set of environmental conditions and see which one they prefer. And again, if you look at my YouTube video on the um, choice chambers for woodlouse, you can have a go and do that. So what I'm going to do and what you must do when you finish looking at your animals in your garden is put the lid back on their house. Because if you can imagine a giant came to your house lifted up the roof of your house, had a good look at you, prodded you a bit, counted your legs and then left the roof off your house, it's not going to be a very nice for you. So we make sure that we put the animals home back where it was. Now there was a spider on here. Can you see that spider again? Nope, he's gone run away. Oh, there he is. Nope, where is he gone? Nope, he's run away. There he is, spider. <laughs> He's going to stay still for us. He's going to stay still for us. Excellent. So, very different from all the other animals we've seen so far because he's got eight legs, apart from our little spider mite. So, eight legs. We've got two body parts. So, we've got the thorax and we've got the abdomen. The abdomen is the round bit at the back on the bottom. 
and this time of year you might find spiders with egg cases. Now egg cases uh, if you see one which has got a white big sack that's dragging behind him, which looks really difficult and probably not the best way to move your, your young around, it's full of baby tiny spiders, probably full of spiders' eggs. And then if you look really carefully, sometimes, I don't know with this one, if you look at their back, when those spiders actually hatch, it could be a hundred or so of them, they actually put them on the back of their abdomen and carry them around as spiderlings. Now I don't think this one's got them, it's very hard, but it's got, it's got what looks like blobs on his abdomen, but I think it's just markings on the spider. But if it's actually got a moving back, it actually could be full of spiderlings. So watch carefully, and when those spiderlings are big enough, they will actually fly off, and I don't mean it's got wings, I mean that they will actually catch hold of the air with some butter with some parachutes made out of um, line and then they'll be going to find another habitat okay right I want to look at another colony down here so this is a colony of hopefully this is the right stone nope not that one there's my one not that one this is a mi proper mini beast hunt here it is okay so here we have a colony of ants. Now, if you look carefully, they're running around very, very fast because they think that I'm going to eat them. And you can see there's one there which is actually carrying some food. There we go. And there's one there which has got an egg. Can you see him there? Now, the ones that are carrying the eggs, these are, this is a, that's a nursemaid, basically. So they've all got different jobs. So this might be a forager and that might be a nursemaid, and they are immediately doing their job, which is to try and collect all their belongings and take them as far away from me as possible, which is going to be down this hole here and into the ground. So each job of this ant is dependent on how they were born, what sex they are, and we've got our worker ants, we've got our soldier ants. So if any of them start heading towards me, they're going to be the fighters, they're soldier ants, and they fight very effectively. They're amazing. And if you look at them, you won't be able to see them, but they can actually squirt acid at me and that will make me itch and hopefully that will make me pick, kick, pick them uh, off me and then I will get so annoyed with them that I will leave them alone. So that's how they defend themselves. And they also fight other ants and they will actually fight to the death. And you will never find two ant colonies too close to each other because they will war with each other so that the other one doesn't get too close. But if you have a look at our model, I've got an ant model here, I can show you the ant life cycle. So again, our ants, six pair, uh, three pairs of legs, so these are insects, and these lay eggs, which look like, a bit like the, caterp uh, put like the caterpillar eggs, but they don't lay them on leaves, they lay them in the ground. So that's our caterpillar, that's our ant eggs. These will hatch out into baby ants, into ant larvae. And these look like tiny little worms, like this, little grubs. Don't have eyes or anything. So these tiny little grubs will be looked after by those nursemaid ants inside the ant colony. And they will be fed. And then they will pupate and turn into oh, a pupa. Ant pupa gone. Oh, can't see any ant pupa. There you go. That's an ant pupa. So again, they cover themselves up in silk, and then they will they will metamorphose, complete metamorphosis, just like the caterpillars. And they will metamorphose from being our grub, our larvae, into our adult. The adult will then lay eggs, and we go round again. So we've got complete metamorphosis because we've got larvae, and then we've got our adult. Right, I think that's it with underneath the, the stones. I'm going to show you an animal now which doesn't completely metamorphose. This is one that I have found. It's not from my garden. So I'm going to show you a specimen that I've got. So this is one of my favourite animals. Okay. He's very delicate because this is actually just the skeleton of the animal and I've got to watch how he doesn't blow away in the wind. Can you see him? This is a dragonfly. 
is a baby dragonfly, but it's not a larvae, it's a nymph. Because it looks as similar to a dragonfly, which I'll show you in a minute, but it's not completely the same because it doesn't have wings, but it's not completely different like a, a caterpillar to a butterfly. So we call this a nymph. So this baby, when it turns from a nymph into a dragonfly, it will do a partial metamorphosis it, it, slightly, so it will grow wings. So these live at the bottom of ponds. So I got this from Crumlin Bog Pond and they've got them at Oxwich, but anywhere they've got ponds, you'll find these living in the mud underneath the water. And they crawl around underneath that mud and they're hijack hunters. So they'll sit around and they'll look and wait in the mud, hiding. And if something then swims past them, like a tadpole, a little fish, underneath, can you see that there? This is a, underneath is their lower jaw, which is called a mask, which is on a hinge. It hinges from here. And when something actually swims past, they will send out that lower jaw, which has got claws on the end, and it will go out and grab hold of that prey, pull it back, and they'll start to eat it. And they can actually eat things which are nearly the same size as them with that prey and with this ambush hunting. So incredible. So they will live underneath the pond for about three, two to three years, maybe longer, depending on the species. And then one day they're nearly old enough to pupate, to turn into an adult. But instead of making cocoon, this animal will find a leaf of a plant that is growing coming out of the pond and it will crawl up that stem and when the air hits that exoskeleton it will go hard and that's what this is here so this exoskeleton has gone hard and if you look on this side you can see there's a gap sorry on this side in between these fake wings these aren't real wings and it will pull itself out of the back of this exoskeleton and come out and when it comes out it's got wings because it's a it's a dragonfly and it will leave behind this exuvia, that's what we call this, which is the exoskeleton of the nymphal stage, leave this on the leaf, it will come out, fill up its wings full of blood, dry them in the, in the air, because of course it's been squished and wet inside there, and then it will fly off, find a mate, mate, and lay its eggs back in the pond, and those will hatch out into new baby larvae, uh, baby nymphs. So if I show you a dragonfly, again, these are ones that I found which were dead. No, I don't want them to blow away, so I've got to be very careful with the wind. Ooh! They're good at flying. They're brilliant at flying, but I don't want them to fly now. So these are dragon flyers. So these are these are both skippers actually. Now, if I take him out, have a look at those amazing wings. So each one of those little veins is full of blood. So when they come out of their nymphal stage, they need to fill them all up with blood and then spread them out because they've all been cropped to fit inside that tiny um, nymphal stage. And then they can fly off. Now dragonflies are the best hunters in, yeah, in the mini beast animal kingdom, in the insect kingdom. And that's because of the wings they've got. So if you look, you've got two pairs of wings most insects do who have got wings have got two pairs but they've all got different ways of using them the butterfly i can't really show you with my butterfly because it's so old but butterfly wings although they've got two pairs the fore and the hind they're zipped together along this edge here so that these two flat together these two always flat together if you look at a fly really closely they don't actually have four wings they used to but over time they've evolved and the, one of the pairs of the wings has actually shrunk down to tiny little, um, they look like clubs, so it's like a line with a blob on the end. And they're used for gyropters, they're used for steering only. So again, only one pair of wings are actually flapping. However, the, the dragonfly, these two pairs are flying independently. So if you see them fly, the front pair will go up, the back pair will go down. Ah, don't fly away and then they'll do that all the time so an amazing amount of coordination between those wings but it means that this dragonfly can fly forwards backwards up down sideways and also hover and not any other none of the other ones can actually do as much maneuvering and it makes them the best agile aerial hunter that we have so if you watch them by a pond they're absolutely stunning and it's incredible the way that they catch just the tiny little flies
If you've only ever been on a butterfly hunt or just trying to follow a flying animal, imagine trying to do that while flying and catching it in your mouth. That's what they do. So incredible eyesight, incredible maneuverability, and one of the best hunters that we've got really flying around in the, in the um, insect kingdom. So beautiful animal. Okay, right, so we're gonna take you to see another nymph from another mini beast that you will find in your garden. So we need to go wandering a bit. Oh, before that, sorry, just a little thing. Lots of animals are living in the grasses in your garden. And if you're doing don't mow in May, which is a brilliant thing for wildlife, which means you don't mow your lawn in May, it gives the opportunity for the insects to live in amongst the plants. It also allows the seeds to come from the, the grasses so that they can actually lay, you know, set, spread their seeds before you mow them. So as you can see, we're not mowing in May and we're gonna see if we can sweep to see if we can see any animals living in amongst the long grass. Now, if you want to do this, but you don't have a sweep net, you could use any net. You can use a net that you use in the, in, for a, um, a little one for a, an aquarium. Maybe you won't get the tiniest animals, but you should be able to find something. But you could use a dustpan and brush even. So I'm just gonna do a quick sweep. So the way you sweep, you just find the longest grass you can, and then you push through the plants backwards and forwards, turning the net as you go. Be careful, don't do it near brambles because it will rip your net and also you'll get stuck. Because all the animals are gonna be holding on tight to these plants. They're also gonna be really camouflaged. So if you go hands and knees looking through the grass, chances are you probably won't find them. You can also do some tree beating with your net as well. And then once, again, I have no idea if we're gonna see anything, once you've done that for a few minutes, roll your net up. You might see anything flying, like these flies here. They'll just fly straight out. There we go, see them going? So we have caught lots of flies. Poof, there we go. But if you're lucky, you might find something crawling around on the bottom. We haven't this time, but if you do this in May or June and July even better, especially in long grass, you find um, some grasshoppers and bush crickets. Those are really amazing things to find and especially using the sweet net. So have a look then. Okay, we're gonna go and find another nymph. Just a quick check as we're going. I did find a newt the last time I was doing this when I was doing so I've already re-recorded -record, re some of this, um, which is on the YouTube channel. So some of the animals you can see in more detail. I actually found a newt while I was digging up the veg patch and I've put him in here, but I can pretty much guarantee he's not gonna be here now. But I thought we'd have a quick look as we go past, see if he wants to play ball. I should say she, she was a girl. No, she's not there. So we could start digging in the veg patch. That's a really good place to find mini beasts. So dig around. See if you can find anything living underneath, but we're not going to do that because it might take a while. Let's see one that we know is going to be here. So recently there was a survey done, and I think you can probably still do it online for these animals. And all you have to look for is this. You've probably seen this before, spit. Now this is an animal living inside this spit, and you may be able to see him. Can you, uh, can you see him there? That blob there, can you see him? Now this is a spittle bug or a frog hopper nymph. So it's not a larvae because it looks similar to the adult. It does metamorphose, but only partially. Now, if you look online or look on the um, YouTube video that I've already posted, you can see what he looks like. And what happens, it's quite incredible actually. Looks like there's two in that one. It's got twins. So the frog hopper mum comes lays its egg onto this plant, and it could be any plant, they're really not fussy. And then the, the nymph sticks its proboscis, that feeding tube, into the plant's sap and starts to suck the sap out. When it sucks it, it then starts to wee. And when it wees, the wee is foam. And so it covers itself in that foam to protect itself. 
So if you ever thought it's a bit ugh, that they're living inside spit, it's actually worse than that. They're living inside their own we. So they're living in this foamy we here, and this is going to protect them from drying out. It's also a bit of camouflage, although to be honest, I think they look even more conspicuous like that. But they can't actually breathe inside there. So you'll see them, they're always close to the surface because their bottom is where they breathe. That will be sticking out of the foam um, because they need to breathe. If they do have a predator come close, they will go into the center and they do a really clever thing. They pop some of the bubbles around their bottom so that they join up together and then they can breathe from the inside of those bubbles until the predator goes and then they'll go back and stick their bottom back out so they can breathe again. So once they're old enough, so these have been laid and these have been overwintering as eggs for the, the winter and then now they start to turn into their nymphs, so they're starting to feed. Once they're up big enough, they will pupate, so they will turn into our adult frog hoppers, so that incomplete retropophosis again. Then they will hop off and go and find a mate and then they will lay eggs on another plant. And if you find a frog hopper, they're called frog hoppers, because if you look at their face, it's meant to look like a frog. But they, these frog hopper nymphs, there he is, he's kind of crawling out there. These are about one millimeter in size. A frog hopper can be up to four millimeters in size. So we're not talking about big animals here. They're really small, but they're amazing because their colors can be very varied and their frog, their hopping ability is really cool so if you do find one just touch its bottom and you'll see it does a huge hop so really good defense so there you go spittle bugs or frog hoppers another of our life cycles okay right i think the last thing we're going to do is going to look at some of the flowers and see if we can find any pollinators inside them now these are the hardest things to film because they're flying they don't stay still so we're just going to have a quick look at our hedge, which has got some rhododendron flowers in. And we might be able to see some pollinators there. But please stay tuned because I've got a really good treat for you at the very end. So heading up to the top of the drive. The next ones at the very top will come into, will come into um, ripeness later so that they can then actually um, pollinate a different flower they don't pollinate themselves right i don't think we can get up to a rhododendron because we're, we're losing connectivity so we're going to stay down right to the coast of the house so unfortunately we won't be able to see any flying animals but before we go so although this week and this month and last month we've managed to do our virtual field trips and our virtual activities in my garden i'm hoping that when the restrictions get reduced a bit but we physically I still can carry on doing these activities online and um, I hope to be able to go out a bit further afield away from my garden so maybe we might be down on the beach and be able to do some virtual rock pooling or maybe some virtual um, so please make sure you subscribe to my youtube channel which is hashtag nature days and follow the facebook page the Gauss Society Youth Facebook page and also the nature days facebook page and then you'll be kept informed of what's going on and whether we can do some more virtual field trip, uh, virtual activities. The other thing is my field trips, because they've been um, there's no going on at the moment. I've been doing challenges for outdoor learning for any homeschoolers. So if you subscribe to my YouTube channel, but also if you look at the Nature Days blog, you'll see that every day that the children are in school or not in school, there's been an outdoor challenge for them to actually undertake and they varied throughout the whole of the um, curriculum and they've all been curriculum based but they've been fun as well and the one on Friday which was really cool which was to create secret messages using nature uh, a tool as a coding tool uh, so please look at those again if you subscribe to the um, YouTube channel and have a look you can go back to all of the challenges and those challenges will be on there forever and if there's any teachers there please share these this will help um, to reduce the load for your planning you can get children to do them and to start doing some outdoor learning in their school in their in their grounds of their house all of them can be done in any garden at all we don't need any equipment or anything also if you are a teacher i've also developed some outdoor learning challenge cards which i'm about to publish so those are looking at some of the activities that i've done through the youtube channel but I've got them going through all of the areas of learning and experience. So there's over 50 cards. They're for independence, so they're helping to you to integrate outdoor learning into your school teaching, but also to increase the rate of 
independence with your children. They're for key stage two, but they are, um, you can differentiate with them and hopefully they should provide you with some ways of getting back into school, especially if we've got social distancing going on or if you have to increase the amount of outdoor learning you have to do because of spacing out in, in your in school. The other thing I wanted to tell you about was if you have any needs for the Gow Society, then please do email us and also look at the Gow Society website. So the Gow Society website has got some really good ID guides there now. You can use those if you're going on your walk. We use some of them for the fossil hunting that we did um, a couple of months ago before the lockdown. So do look at the Gow Society um, website because it's got some great resources. Then the last thing is, really enjoy coming on the May Day Fete and the thing you love most is the food that I provide that I've foraged. Obviously we couldn't have the May Day Fete this year because of the lockdown so what I've done is I've created a YouTube a video that has got a recipe recipes for lots of those foods that I usually provide. So there is a video for um, stinging nettle soup, the wild garlic pesto and there's a new one for dandelion honey. So if you want to make dandelion honey really easy you do need a lot of dandelions but if you're doing no mo um, may then you'll have dandelions. so let the pollinators take what they need then you can harvest all of the, the flower heads create some honey and if you're vegan it's a lovely substitute and it's very easy to make in the fridge for quite a while and it's it's kind of caramelly to start with piece of that floweriness so it is a bit like honey it's, a, it's quite an amazing um um, recognizable honey substitute so have a go at that so if you want videos also as the elderflower comes into season I'll be doing posting a video on elderflower cordial and elderflower champagne so if you want to follow us subscribe and then you'll be able to have access to all the foraging videos as well so please do like share whatever you do with social media with the Facebook page the Nature Days Facebook page and the Gower Society Youth Facebook page and also join us on the YouTube channel and subscribe and please tune in again and thank you for watching and I hope you enjoyed our virtual mini beast hunt.